Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. It is a great paradox in comet science. We are told that a comet nucleus is a ball of ice, or dirty snowball, or icy fluff ball that accreted billions of years ago in the solar system's infancy. Comets are said to sublimate ices as they move toward the sun, and solar warming is responsible for much cometary activity, including the energetic jets and the production of the familiar coma and tail. More recently, as the required ices have not been observed on comet nuclei, scientists and science media have taken to referring to comets as, quote, deep fried ice cream, insisting that the body of ice must be present, but is buried under an outer crust. Yet this reasoning leaves unexplained countless puzzles in comet science. For instance, it is an unresolved mystery how a so-called ball of ice, deep fried or otherwise, can survive an extremely close approach to the sun, as we see with occasional sun grazer comets. In 2011, the comet Lovejoy astonished astronomers when the comet nucleus somehow survived intact after one hour in the sun's corona. Also unresolved is the question of how comets begin producing evidence of water in their comas at vast distances from the sun, much too far to explain through solar heating. Such was the case with the comet 67P, whose apparent water output, as well as the production of an amazing abundance of rich molecules, was first detected while still hundreds of millions of kilometers from the sun. And countless other enduring puzzles abound. We ask the question, can the science of electrochemistry provide the answer to many comet mysteries? Dr. Franklin Anariba, a specialist in electrochemistry, was a featured speaker at the Thunderbolts Project's international conference, The Tipping Point, in 2013. Dr. Anariba is also scheduled to speak at the forthcoming 2015 conference, Paths of Discovery, taking place June 25th to 29th in Phoenix, Arizona. We now present you in full Dr. Anna Reba's 2013 talk, Cometary Electrochemistry. A transcript of the talk may be found in the description box of this video. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is try to give you an illustration of um, what can happen actually in comets. So as you can see, the title of my, of my, my talk here is Cometary Electrochemistry. And actually, that's the only thing that's new here is the term. When you look at the literature, for instance, you see the astroelectrochemistry actually is, is there's plenty of material there. Astroelectrochemistry means that a lot of the reactions that happen in space are actually driven by uh, a potential difference. In addition, I came across a series of Russian scientists who actually propose that electricity in the nucleus of comets can actually drive the de-icing process of, say, water of methane. So those ideas are not new. What is new here is the idea that you have uh, electrochemistry or electricity driving uh, chemical reactions either in the nucleus of the comets or in the comets of the comets. That's what's new, and that's what I want to talk about. And I figured that most of you don't know who I am, and so I just wanted to pinpoint here the fact that I live in, in Singapore. I've been work, living and working there for four years. And I think some of you, I think I talked, have been there before. All right, so this is the outline of my talk. It's going to be brief, and I'm going to keep it simple because the audience is very diverse. Uh, tell you a little bit uh, about what is electrochemistry, what is the composition of comets, and how the combination of these two uh, concepts can actually allow us to provide with a, you know, a theoretical framework uh, of um, reactions happening in comets. I'll also mention the electrochemical model in, in, in question, the question about cyanide production and how that model can actually explain this. And I just make a, a one prediction. If this model is correct, there should be one observation that we should be able to see in the future. Okay, so what is very interesting from a chemistry standpoint is that um, energy, in a way, or electricity is kind of free in nature. This is a very good example here, and you probably know this. This is a zinc material. Uh, uh, and here we have a copper. And once we connect these two, what's going to happen is that electrons that are actually in the zinc will actually go in the direction of the copper. Now, electrons going, flowing in a particular direction is electricity. This happens spontaneously. So nature actually gives us uh, 
free energy. The energy that you need to spend is in how you arrange these materials. So that's, that's the main concept here. Now, another concept that I want, to, I want to pinpoint here is this. In electrochemistry, if you have this particular cell, which is a voltaic cell, uh, as a function of time, what's going to happen is the zinc material will actually dissolve. It gives us the electron, and at the same time, that electron comes from the atom, the atom becomes an ion, right? So in the negative side, in the negative region of the, uh, the particular cell, you get dissolution. And on the positive region here in the copper, uh, you're going to get an accumulation of material. This, this material comes in because this, this, uh, this uh, copper here is in solution. This is a copper solution, right? But any other material will be attractive because in this region, you're going to have extra electrons, so they'll be attracted to it. They will ca capture these electrons, and the material will accumulate. So the key point here is that you have active electrodes. You're going to have dissolution on the negative region. You're going to have accumulation of material in the positive region. That's the key part here of this slide. Now, energy, like I said before, is, is naturally stored in metals. We can harness it. It's not difficult to harness it. We actually do it all the time. The example of this is batteries. Batteries is, is, is energy, right? This is stored. And, we, and the only difference here is how it's arranged. That's it. Um, another concept that I want to introduce here in this, in this slide is uh, the, the idea of having inert electrodes. Here I'll show you active electrodes. The, actually, the electrode itself actually um, dissolves and accumulates. And in this particular uh, example here, what I want to say is that you can have electrodes which actually provide only the surface where the electrochemical reaction occurs. Good example of these are carbon, gold, palladium, platinum, for instance, because they're no, no reactive materials. Right? Now, this is going to come handy when you think about the nuclear of a comet and reactions actually occurring in that particular case, in location. Now, I know some of you have no background in electrochemistry. Uh, the chemistry is actually a very difficult subject. So what I'm do, do here is I'm going to tell you what is the main concept of electrochemistry. It's very simple. You can have a reduction and oxidation reaction. Here's an example of an oxidation reaction uh, which occurs in a negative charge region. And I'm doing this on purpose because the terminology that we use in electrochemistry is different from physicists and engineers in terms of cathode and anode. So in the negative charge region, you have, you say, for instance, an atom or iron atom. It gives up three electrons, and you get an ion, right? These electrons over here, if you're able to push them in a particular direction, is what gives us a, a current. And the reduction will actually occur in the uh, positive charge region. A yeah, good example here, two protons plus two electrons will give you hydrogen gas. All right, so now this is the basic electrochemistry. This is what I'm going to say about electrochemistry at this point. What I'm going to do now is talk about comets. What is the composition of comets? Well, now we know the comets are actually formed by several minerals, kind of minerals. This is a good example over here. This is olivine, associated with volcanism, means that it's probably associated with high temperatures, and maybe with lightning. And this is just various forms of olivine. And what I'll pinpoint to you is the fact that they have the rich in transition metals. Transition metals are important in electrochemistry because either they provide an inert surface or they provide electrons. They're easy to reduce and oxidize. They have various oxidation states. Uh, another point I want to pinpoint here is that this is all silicates, silicon and oxygen. Silicon and oxygen um, are very abundant. Oxygen is a very rich electron, uh, atom, uh, electron rich, which can also provide the electrons to provide current, provided you have a potential difference. Another example is uh, vigenite, associated with uh, Mars and moon meteorites. Again, very rich in iron. Cubanite. Copper, iron, and, and sulfur form in liquid water. This has been found in comets. Um, this is very interesting because that means very complex uh, chemistry going on here. Uh, also rich in, in iron. Another uh, transition metal that, be, that have been found in the nuclei of comets are titanium, vanadium in the form of nitrides, platinum, osmium, ruthenium, tungsten, molybdenum, just to mention a few. So you can see it's very complex. The composition from electrochemical uh, standpoint is complex in comets. Um, in the coma of comets, this is the several gases that have been identified, um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, a series of oxides with nitrogen, sulfur oxides, hydroxyl, and I left out oxygen, uh, and molecular, molecular oxygen, and molecular nitrogen. So you find all this compounds in comets. 
that will tell you already that this is very complex chemistry going on here. In addition to that, you find organic molecules. Methane, cyanide, methanol, uh, ethane, uh, ethane, ethane, ammonia, car carbonates. This are, again, the level of complexity is beginning to get more uh, higher, I would say. And more complex organic molecules have been identified in comments. I mean, let's see natural, for instance, vinegar, acetic acid, amorphous carbon, you can think about charcoal. Uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons will be very important in, in, in agriculture, for instance. People who do, you know, do work in agriculture, they always talk about pHs because they control basically the pH and, and, uh, of soils, for instance. And um, surprisingly, glycine, this is an amino acid. So how can this model work? I talk about the chemistry, I'm talking about the composition of comets. So how can we apply this electrochemical model? Here's a cartoon. And it's not up to scale, as you can see. This, here we have the sun, and here we have the solar wind, which are called the proton flux, because that's mostly the composition, even though there's some electrons in there. And here we have the nuclear, a nucleus, a dust tail, ion plasma tail, and a coma. This is, what, this is what we see, right? This is the uh, typical observation for comets. So what I'm proposing here is this paradigm or this model can, can be true if we show that we have a potential difference. In this particular case, uh, making the sun the positive region because of the, of the, uh, the protons and uh, or the solar wind, and the, nu the nucleus will be the negative region. Now, if you're able to show this, then you can apply without fear an electrochemical model. So this is the key part. And I think this is why it's going to take us a lot of time in the future, trying to show that there's a potential difference here. You can do it indirectly. Now, in detail, how is this model going to work? Well, it will work in the following way. Here, here is, a, is a, an electro negative region, which is, can be the, nu the nucleus, right? Because it's rich in minerals, with silicates and transition metals. And here it would be the solar wind, which surrounds the, the nucleus as the comet approaches the sun. OK, so what we need to do here, like I said before, is to have a potential difference. If this is the case, this will drive any reaction. As long as, you know, the key part here is that that, that potential difference is, is, is big enough to drive the, any reaction that you want. We do this in the lab all the time. Now, this potential difference is going to create a current flow from the nucleus towards the, uh, the positive region, which is the solar wind. While doing so, you're going to see the coma. Why? Because what happens is you have this flow of electrons. The electrons are going to collide with some of the electrons on, the, on, on, on the, these molecules. Say, for instance, uh, carbon monoxide, right? So the electron uh, that's being driven from the nucleus towards the uh, positive region will go through the coma, collide with some of these gases. It's going to excite electrons from, from, C, from CO, carbon monoxide, to a higher energy state. <coughs> When it decays down, it is going to give off energy. This energy is the one we see in terms of, you know, in the visible range, right? So the intensity of the coma and the color of the coma will depend on what kind of uh, gas is being excited, right? So it, it depends on the abundance. Now, what kind of reactions can we have on the, on the nucleus? And it might get a little bit complex for some of you because this is chemistry, but I will keep it simple here. We know that iron 2 plus, for instance, exists in these minerals. Right? It's, it's already ion, but if you, since you have a potential difference, thermodynamically speaking, this is possible. You can give off another electron. Uh, this electron means current. The same for manganese and so on and so forth. Um, even you can even have manganese react with some of the, uh, the water vapor or gases that can be in a coma. You can have more complex structures. You can, you can form solids, uh, manganese oxide, for instance. And again, you get current. Some of the silicate material that, that I show you like, that are part of the mineral can react with protons from the solar wind, and you can get some hydroxides. I mean, the possibilities are endless, right? Because we don't know exactly what's really happening there. The point here is that you can get current and you can get uh, material. What happens on the positive side? On the positive side, I can envision only one type of reaction, and it is the formation of hydrogen gas. That's it, all right? OK. so. In more detail, if we, have, if we have a comet here, this is a cartoon, 
this model can actually explain the plasma formation of the coma, right? Depending again on, on the abundance of all these gases, maybe all the gases that are left out. So for instance, if you have 80% cyanide uh, abundance, you get one particular color and particular intensity. If you have oxygen, a higher abundance of 80%, the color of the coma and the intensity of the coma is gonna be different. All right, let me see if I can finish this up soon. The plasma tail can be explained by the formation of ions. The plasma tail is mostly positive ions, so it can be explained here. In addition to that, the, the dust tail can be explained by the formation of these uh, uh, solids, oxides, hydroxides, in addition to that also some chunks of minerals. And most importantly here is that uh, I, when I start talking about, uh, thinking about this particular model, I predicted the formation of hydrogen gas even before I read the literature because I have no background on, uh, on comets. And what I was able to see here is that it was, it was very exciting, is that Hell Bob, for instance, comet, a hydrogen cloud was actually observed, very large hydrogen cloud. So this model sort of explains that. Now, um, how can we know this electrochemical process going on in comets? There was this was particular observation a few years ago, uh, cyanide formation and no dust formation. So what happened here is this, in the standard model, Whenever you have sublimation of a gas, dust will always form because the idea is that you have a, a dirty ball, a dirty ice, ice ball, right? So sublimation of, say, water will actually bring out formation of gas, uh, excuse me, of particles. In this case, we don't see that. So how can we, how can we explain this electrochemistry? Uh, two different ways. One way is the standard electrochemistry where the reaction actually occurs in the nucleus, right? <clears throat> and I was able to see, for instance, and I'm, I'm rushing here because of time, uh, what I was able to see here is that um, amino, amines actually precursor for cyanide formation, provided you have acidic conditions. And, and the presence of protons or the, the solar wind is, is a, is, is, uh, ma makes it amenable or viable. So this is a, a, a methyl amine. We have a glycine, a more complex amines, but as long as you have these structures there, in a coma or in the nucleus, you can get, uh, you can get cyanide. Uh, I'm gonna skip this slide here, or I'm just gonna mention very really quick, is that this is a way that you can actually do experiments on, on the lab. You can actually have those gases in this container. Here you have two electrodes, tungsten and stainless steel. You apply a potential and you carry the reaction. Once you have the reaction, you apply an electric field, and you push it into a mass spectrometer and you can detect the, the product. And this work has been done already. Um, by uh, Navarro Gonzalez in, in National University of Mexico. Uh, he was trying to simulate, um, trying to simulate the uh, reactions in the ionosphere of Titan, and um, that's what he did. So uh, this is a 19, 1967 work by Matthew, C.N. Matthews, I think it was mentioned yesterday, that this particular uh, experiment will actually give you amino acids. But this particular experiment also give you, if you have a combination of methane and ammonia, it will also give you cyanide radicals. If you have a coronal discharge, and this has been done, this is experimental data, you also get hydrocarbons and cyanide. Importantly, if you simulate lining, nitrogen and methane, you also get hydrocarbons and cyanide. So there are two possibilities here. And I got a few more slides, I think, uh, to go. Um, here, what I'm gonna show you here briefly is that you can have a reversibility between CO and, and alcohols. CO and alcohols CO and alcohols and methane. So there's no direct connection between CO and, and cyanide, which I, I was looking for. It's a two-step process. You can have the reduction of CO into, into, into methane, and then this can be uh, through, uh, you know, maybe electrical discharge form cyanide. This is a two-step process. I didn't find one voice directly. And this is the last slide here. So please bear with me. I got 17 minutes. I think I got one minute left. This is a cyclable tomogram. Some of you have never seen this before, all right? So let me see if I can, I can help you out follow it. This is a graph of voltage in this direction and current in this direction. I, did, I didn't write it here, my, my, my negligence. This is current, this is voltage. If you start a voltage A, and I give you the direction over here, this is, a, you know, you have two electrodes and you have a, a solution, for instance, or you have gases. If you, have, if you go from voltage A to voltage B, and you have chemicals in, in this system, you be able to see some sort of reduction process here. So whatever chemical it is, it will gain an electron or several electrons. And you move it all the way to voltage B. And then if you reverse it, right, whatever compound you, you form here by the reduction process, 
would be oxidized. And eventually you get to this point. So here you have a reduction oxidation. This is a typical, typical uh, cycle voltammetry uh, process. Now, how can this apply to comets? Well, if you, if, if this is the, uh, the sun, and here's the, uh, the orbit of the comet a little bit. Uh, and this is the direction of the comet. If you go in this direction, for instance, as the comet approaches the sun, you should be able to see a reaction. Whatever reaction would that be? It depends on the composition. As the comet departs the sun, you should be able to see another type of reaction. If it is reversible, you should be the reversibility here. But OK, maybe it's not reversible. But you should be able to see a reaction here and another reaction here. So this is the prediction that I make. And a good example here is um, going between amino and, and cyanide. Right? I don't know if NASA has made these observations, but this should be something that should occur. All right, so this is the last slide here. Uh, thank you for your time. And what I'm basically saying here is that this is an illustration. This is still not a theory. This is just an illustration because I only have four weeks to work <laughs> on this. Um, um, but it seems to me that this electrochemical model, provided you have, provided you have, and I say I repeat, a voltage difference can account for the hydrogen gas formation, the plasma and the coma, dust tail formation, and the ionized plasma that you see, that you see there. And actually, this, uh, uh, and also any other reaction that doesn't involve dust, dust formation. And this model can actually allow us to predict based on, on, on the uh, reversibility of electrochemical systems. What could happen? Well, thank you for your time. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info.